Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks again for signing in. To, we have a very exciting uh, Interventional Oncology Journal Club tonight. Um, before I uh, introduce our host, I just want to let you guys know we do have a couple of uh, pain service line webinars and a journal club coming up in the next two weeks. So if you haven't gotten the information for those, look out for that in your email. And uh, we, we hope you can join us for those two. Um, I'm going to introduce DJ Perry. He's very active in the resident and fellow section at the Interventional Oncology uh, Service Line. Um, if you're interested in getting involved in the RFS, you can go to our webpage, rfs.surweb.org, or uh, you'll be able to email DJ if you want to. So DJ, uh, thanks for set, helping setting this up, and uh, the stage is yours. Oh, well, thanks a ton, Dave. Thanks for all your help, too. Um, welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our first Interventional Oncology JVIR Journal Club. Um, like Dave said, I'm DJ Perry. I'm a recently upgraded PGY4, I guess you could say, at radiology uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle. And then I'm the current head of the Interventional Oncology Service Line for the RFS and have been for about a year and a half, and I'll be slowly fading out. But it's been amazing to watch the service line grow from five active members to almost 40 in the last year and a half, and there are some amazing individuals. We are gaining traction on some great projects. And this journal club and other webinars are the result of one of those committees and then also the support of a lot of our faculty members and starting to collaborate on those issues. And we really appreciate all they're doing for us. We also want to extend a special thanks to Dr. Zuf Haskal for letting us use these articles, which are hot off the press, and to our participating faculty members which include Dr. Bob Lewandowski, um, who is Director of Interventional Oncology and Associate Professor at Northwestern, and then also Dr. Dan Brown, who is Chief of Interventional Oncology at Vanderbilt, and then many other participating faculty as well. They'll probably be joining us later. I also want to thank our two RFS presenters, Eric Velez and Chris Moran, who I'll introduce here in a little bit, but they have volunteered to summarize these two interesting articles. and and they have interests in both of these areas. So, um, For those of you that may have to go, this will be recorded and it will be posted on YouTube for future reference and review, just like a lot of our other webinars. But please feel free to message me if you have questions throughout the presentation and if we have time during the discussion portion or at the end, we can ask our faculty members or open it up for general discussion. Our first article will be summarized by Eric Velez. He is a fourth year now medical student at UCSF. He's going to be doing the uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute SIR Medical Research Fellowship this year and will be studying cancer ablation. So he will be presenting the article by Dr. Carol Ridge et al. on RFA of T1 lung cancers. And so I will turn things over to Eric first. Go ahead, Eric. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, like DJ said, I'm Eric Velez, and I'll be presenting the RFA of T1 lung carcinoma comparisons of outcomes for first primary metachronous and synchronous lung tumors by Carol Ridge and et al. Um, and so this was actually just released in July's issue of uh, JVIR, so it's pretty new and uh, pretty relevant. Um, and so first we want to talk about why this paper is important to us. Um, in the field of IR. And so, as many of you may know, lung cancer is actually the most common cancer worldwide, accounting for about 13% of cancers, um, and 85% of which are non-small cell lung carcinoma, which is what this paper is talking about. And it's also the leading cause of cancer-related death, uh, about 1.6 million deaths in uh, 2012. And additionally, um, it's also the most common site of metastasis of such as like colorectal cancer, breast and renal carcinoma. Uh, so while this is mainly looking at primary lung cancer, this um, ablation modality may have future potential for um, metastatic tumors as well. Um, and so for the focus of this paper, I'll just be talking about the treatment of stage one non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and so that typically equates to about 17% of lung cancers. Uh, the primary treatment for these cancers is lobectomy or um, segmental slash sublobar resection with adjuvant chemotherapy. And the overall survival rate of that is usually around 50 to 65%, which is pretty good. 
However, about 20 to 25 percent of these patients are non-surgical candidates. Uh, this is typically caused from impaired pulmonary function and cardiovascular disease. And so alternative therapies are usually needed for these people. Um, currently, the um, NCCN guideline is to use uh, stereotactic body radiation therapies with uh, overall survivals around for three years around 32 to 56 percent and five year survivals of 32 to 45 percent. Um, and because these survival rates aren't very satisfactory, um, many alternative therapies are being investigated such as RFA, microwave, cryo, and IRE. Um, but there's not enough long-term data right now to uh, compare the efficacy to SBRT, which is why this paper is being done. So now to go into the specifics of the paper. Um, for the methods of the paper, essentially what they did was a retrospective study of patients with T1 uh, non-small cell lung cancer who underwent um, RFA between 2006 and 2012. Uh, the primary exclusion criteria was chemo within the preceding 12 months prior infield radiation therapy or prior lung tumor resection the same location that was to rule out any chance of local recurrence and then less, to, less than 12 months of clinical slash radiological follow-up after ablation. Uh, and so for the patient demographics, there was a total of 29 patients, 21 which had T1A lung cancer and, T, and 8 that had T1B. Um, 11 had the first primary tumors, 14 had metachronous tumors. Uh, metachronous tumor is essentially a patient who's had previously treated lung cancer with a different histology or greater than four-year interval between the previous cancer diagnosis. And then four patients who had synchronous tumors, which is essentially they had at least two distinct pulmonary nodules with a different histology um, or anatomically distinct. Um, and the clinical indications for the study for RF ablation were poor um, cardiopulmonary reserve in 19 of the patients, and then 10 of the patients were referring clinician preference or patient preferences. Um, the average tumor size or median tumor size in this study were, was about 14 millimeters, and the median tumor distance from the pleural was 10 millimeters. And then the median surveillance period was around 30 months with a range of 12 to 85. And the surveillance was primarily done with the CT or PET CT. And then as far as the results, so technically uh, the RF ablation was 97% successful and 97% effective. There was essentially only two issues. One patient had difficulty maintaining oxygen saturation during the ablation, and so it had to be aborted. And then one patient had a FDG avid tumor on the first surveillance PET CT, so the RF ablation was considered failed. Um, as expected, the complication rate was about 38 percent, which is lower than surgery, um, which is expected for patients getting minimally invasive therapy, uh, which is surgery range, ranges around 46 percent. Uh, so the pneumothorax, eight patients had pneumothorax, and seven of which were needed to be treated and three had symptomatic pleural effusions, while two actually developed uh, brachial neuropathies, less phrenic neuropathies, and one patient had a post-extubation strider. Uh, so the overall survival, oh, sorry, did I skip slide? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, sorry, tumor progression. Uh, so 11 out of the 29 patients experienced tumor progression throughout the follow-up, seven of which had local progression, six had distant, and five had regional. Um, what's interesting is that the tumor progression was actually higher in the, the, or shorter, yeah, in the progression for first primary tumors and then for the metachronous and synchronous tumors, they had lower rates of local progression. Uh, this is probably um, because of lead time bias because these patients with primary tumors may have been diagnosed later as the patients with the synchronous and metachronous tumors were going under surve surveillance since they had the other two previous tumors diagnosed. Um, as far as the overall survival, uh, as you can see from this, there was the T1B and the first primary and synchronous tumors. The five-year survivals were not, not reached. They don't actually drop down to zero. But 
the overall estimated overall survival was around 55% for first primary tumors, 63% for metachronous tumors, and 75% for synchronous tumors. And again, that's probably because of the lead time bias. Because you would expect the first primary tumors to have a better survival rate than the, the metachronous. And the five-year overall survival was only 14%, while the three-year was 60%, and the one-year was 100%. Okay. Um, so this RFA was tolerated procedure, and it did have good outcomes uh, for local progression and progression-free survival, and it was technically very successful. Um, the similar outcomes for the first primary synchronous and metachronous tumors uh, suggest that RFA may be an appropriate therapy for each tumor. And other reported three to five year survival ranges between 36 to 88 um, percent and 19 to 27 percent, while the SBRT survival one year or three years is 32 to 56 percent and the five years 32 to 45 percent. So by looking at this, it does seem that the SBRT survival rates are currently higher, although this is just one retrospective study, so it's not clear on how well you can compare the two. Um, and then there are several limitations to this study. I mean, it was a limited population size, and most of the patients had adenocarcinoma, uh, so there wasn't that much heterogeneity. Um, and the patients um, with were had predominantly inoperable tumors, so these patients already are expected to have worse clinical outcomes than people who are surgical candidate candidates. So I, it's unclear if you can really compare these results to, like, let's say, someone who were to go and have surgery, um, and it's a retrospective review. And also in the paper, it notes that the author's institution typically considers RFA as an alternative option in patients who. SBRT cannot be performed, although they didn't state the specific reasons. So you could even think that these patients may even have a worse clinical outcome if they had SBRT as well, given that they couldn't tolerate that. Uh, and then stage 1 um, excludes stage 1B patients, essentially patients who have T2A, um, which would be expected to have worse clinical results. Um, and, and all, most of the data out there is for stage 1 uh, lung cancer as opposed to T1. Uh, so it's hard to compare percentages between SBRT and this study because it doesn't include all of the stage 1. And then also the small sample size. And then there's several questions. If we uh, we will probably end up addressing some of these as uh, our faculty discuss this topic for us, but then we can open it up to everybody else as well. Um, doctors Brown and Lewandowski, how often should we be seeing these things and do you think this is something that will start gaining traction in the future? I think um, there's been a lot of studies done on this over the years as far as RF goes, and it hasn't gotten as much traction. There's probably a lot of stress among other specialties about it getting more, quite frankly. Um, I think that the, um, um, the outcomes need to be a little bit better, and I, you know, I worked at one of the institutions that did a lot of the stereotactic stuff early on. They were early adopters. and, and um, you know, for the guys that have the good equipment that they don't need fiducials and stuff like that, it's hard to argue, you know, treatment without the risk of a pneumothorax versus treatment with the risk of a pneumothorax until we have better data. And, and uh, you know, the Memorial guys do a good job. Uh, they, they, they're very involved in this. And, you know, you can see from the paper they did 300-some ablations over the course of this study. Mm -hmm. But... You know, we need, and this is kind of the idea of some of the uh, registries and stuff that are being organized, is to get more data, to be more competitive. So the NCCM looks at this stuff and says ablation is as good as SBRT, and that's the that needs to be the goal going forward to get this stuff referred over because a lot of centers follow those NCCM guidelines very closely. Uh, Bob, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree, Dan. That um, you know, the NCCM guidelines make a big difference. Radiation oncologists have really 
and a long-standing history with medical oncology and surgical oncology that we're still developing at, at many centers. At, at centers like Vanderbilt and Northwestern, uh, I think we probably have robust practices and, and we have an equal say at the, the, the table. You know, whenever you see patients, you have to think about what is the best, um, the best therapy for that patient. And you know, if you have to place a fiducial and do X, uh, SPRT, it, it may not be as, as um, attractive versus just doing ablation on certain tumors. I will say there's more enthusiasm, it seems, for microwave ablation and, and maybe cryoablation in the lung than there is for RF ablation, um, having to do with the physics and the impedance of the air and things like that. So, you know, we I think the, the most robust data that we have is with radiofrequency ablation in the lung, but I think uh, over the course of time we'll see that change a little bit. You guys, we do, this is an area that uh, I know we don't do a lot at my institution yet. We'll occasionally get a a T1 lung cancer, and it's basically a method of last resort for IR to see them when they aren't an operative candidate, and everybody else has kind of taken their armamentarium and said, well, we've done everything we can. Let's send them to IR and see if they can do something. But seeing papers like this kind of give us some traction and at least start building up data where like you were saying, if we start getting these databases and registries growing, we can start showing the value of these things and maybe um, not just with lung cancer and RFA, but ideally lots of other procedures. Um, were there any other questions from the audience that we want to cover really quick before we move on to the next article? we got about five minutes for questions or comments. And if not, we'll just start with our next article. And one, one other comment just before we start, go forward, uh, it, it's Dan talking. Um, yeah. There's a paper, the Rapture Study, the Lencioni wrote, which is a pretty good prospective study. So if you're trying to get some traction in your institution, that might be a good place to start. Um, but that being said, I mean, uh, there's some programs build certain things over others. And it's just one thing to keep in mind. It's, it's hard to have everything at every program and so um, you, know, you start with the base with what you can get, and then you, over time you try to grow and adapt into new areas. So just keep that in mind as you're going through your own careers. That's great. I think a lot of us on this call are in different stages of training, and sometimes I feel like we're just going along for the ride. But especially being involved with the RFS and stuff has helped me realize that sometimes you can be that person that just – you know, puts that bug in someone's ear and then things start growing. So just knowing where those articles are and which ones can really start gaining traction anywhere is helpful. So thanks. Go ahead with that question. I oh, sure. Sorry. No, yeah, sure. I don't so, see it either. Oh, so uh, a couple of questions. Sorry about this. This is from one of the presenters through the chat box. Why aren't more people discussing combined SBRT with ablation? You know, this is, this is Bob. Um, you know, there are people that do this, and, and uh, probably the, the people I've seen the most is Damien Dupuy and his group, um, you know, in the Northeast, and, and they've done, um, you know, bigger tumors invading the chest wall. So they've had some, some nice results on that. Um, uh, but it is, it's interesting. Um, it's like every other therapy, uh, you know, combining our therapies with other, um, other physicians and other specialties is something that's evolving. Um, and we might see that not only with ablation, um, but I know that the radiation oncologists are very interested in, in getting involved in the liver. And you know, some centers now have trials combining uh, chemobilization, oily chemobilization with lipidol and SBRT. So the lipidol acts sort of as a fiducial. So I think in you know, and then we look at intraarterial therapies for for different liver diseases, and we're trying to combine systemic therapies with with say radioembolization, et cetera. So. Um, I think we'll be seeing more of that. I, I think that combining the debulking uh, nature of, of radioembolization or, or other intraarterial ablative therapies with either systemic or SBRT um, are things we'll be seeing more of. It's just, again, it's a matter of the evolution of our specialty. Um, and now we're recognized by many other specialties as having something to offer. And, and um, I, I think, we'll, again, we'll see a lot of that happening. Great. In addition to uh, pneumothorax, are there any other complications that people should be watching for, increased risk of infection, bleeding, things like that, that are significant complications that could limit this procedure? 
you know, to me, the biggest thing is, you know, if you have a pneumothorax, it just takes a long time to heal. And, and one situation you can get that is if you burn all the way back to the pleura. Uh, Bob mentioned uh, cryo, and cryo potentially can be a little less damaging if you get back to the pleura. And, and if you create a, a bronchopleural fistula, that can be something that really doesn't heal well. And that's where that argument of the potential risk of pneumothorax is you know, justifies the greater use of SBRT. So, you know, like anything, patient selection is important, and if you have multiple modalities available in your IO arsenal, hopefully you can avoid some of the complications. That's great. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, Eric, for summarizing that article. You did a great job. We will, if we have some time at the end, we'll also do some polling questions for the audience, and take any additional questions, but I think we'll move on to our next article. Um, it's on outpatient taste by Dr. Felipe Nasser et al., which will be summarized for us by Dr. Chris Moran. Chris just finished residency at Mount Sinai in St. Luke's Roosevelt and is now a full-fledged fellow. He's been a major contributor to the IO service line this last year and has also been helping to organize our website in addition to preparing for this presentation. <laughs> so his contributions are greatly appreciated. Uh, okay. Um, can uh, everyone see my screen okay? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I just, um, um, I just started a fellowship at what's now called uh, Mount Sinai St. Louis Roosevelt. Um, so the paper um, is the safety and feasibility of same-day discharge of patients with hepatocellular carcinoma, um, as you can see here, um, after chemoembolization. Um, so, you know, I felt that the relevance uh, of this article was that um, there have been a few studies that have evaluated the safety and feasibility of same-day discharge of patients with liver cancer. Um, it kind of helps you judge when it's safe uh, to discharge a patient on the same day. And I think uh, in the kind of era of healthcare reform, this may become uh, increasingly important as uh, it can help uh, rein in costs. And it's also you know, good for the patient if you can get them out of the hospital. Um, I, I put some uh, very basic information in here, uh, assuming that we might have people joining us from all kind of uh, points in training. Um, some of these terms are just things that help uh, when uh, reading uh, articles on this. So, just the basic types of embolization that you can have uh, bland or chemo embolization. Um, the, the big thing, just embolization in general, is just that it takes advantage of the dual supply to the liver. That um, the tumors often um, are fed more by uh, uh, arteries than um, veins, but the um, but then the portal veins. Uh, that being said, something interesting I was reading was that. As uh, patients become uh, have more hepatic uh, dysfunction due to cirrhosis, it, um, the normal tissue also gets perfused a little bit more by the arteries. So you have to be just that's why with patients with a higher degree of liver failure, sometimes you have to be much more careful about you know how much you would embolize. But um, the other types of uh, so bland embolization uh, doesn't involve chemotherapy, and then chemoembolization with um, conventional, which is when you uh, administer um, a chemotherapy with uh, lipiodol, and then uh, often followed by uh, bland embolization. And then also there's embolization with drug eluting beads, which are um, uh, chemotherapy in pregnant beads. Uh, we won't speak about uh, radial embolization tonight, as that's not the uh, topic of the article. Um, commonly treated liver tumors um, are, are listed here. I think it, um, you know, it's these are, uh, in many cases, some things which give predominantly uh, liver metastasis, or in some cases, ex exclusively um, in patients. So um, most of the data that we have is uh, for the, uh, the first two, as it's, they're a little bit more common. Um, so HDC is the fifth most common cancer in the world, uh, third most deadly cancer. Um, the risk factors, I think, just so kind of going back to med school, it's, most of the patients have cirrhosis. Um, as I recall, hep B is the one that you can kind of have it not be cirrhotic, but um, you know, all these are kind of related to, to cirrhosis. Um, aflatoxin is a carcinogen from uh, aspergillus that can kind of work synergistically with some of these others. 
um, alcoholism, you know, with increasing uh, metabolic syndrome, um, when patients have NASH, sometimes you can develop HCC because of that. I remember that fibromyalgia or in younger patients, sometimes you can have none of these risk factors. Um, so the, the treatment, um, and I'll go over kind of the, the schema briefly about how patients are assigned these different uh, treatment arms, but um, it's uh, resection or a transplant um, uh, resection if it's something that can be just isolated and resected. Um, tumor ablation, uh, the first year kind of viewed as the quote-unquote curative. And then uh, for selected patients, chemoembolization, um, which can be used for uh, a bridging therapy uh, to bring them, uh, to keep them where they are so that they can meet criteria for transplant, which we'll talk about, or downstaging in order to get them into the kind of transplant uh, classification. Uh, the big thing why these are the uh, treatments is just that it, historically uh, it, uh, liver cancer and HCC is a, a poorly receptive to uh, chemotherapeutic agents. Uh, there is a medication uh, called uh, serafinib or, uh, that has some survival benefit in patients with HCC and then one of the, the schema, I'll show you where that kind of falls in for patients. Um, you know, the, I think the big theme, and instead of, you know, reading off all of the different classifications is to evaluate liver function or um, uh, tumor size, I, I think just the thing to keep in mind is that when you're tr treating a patient with liver cancer, often cases because they're cirrhotic, you're not just concerned about uh, the tumor, but you're also dealing with someone with an underlying sick liver. So in tailoring, tailoring your treatments, you have to look at both things. Um, so just a briefly, so uh, TNM staging, um, it includes tumor size, but doesn't uh, include the uh, functional uh, liver disease. And the other thing is it, it requires a um, uh, actual tissue. So this is actually sometimes better for staging afterwards, better than um, planning uh, treatment uh, prior to. Uh, the child Q score um, gives you the functional status, but without the uh, tumor size. And um, other schemas, such as the uh, Barcelona, uh, the BCLC um, uh, method, uh, which is kind of validated on, on their experience um, with their patients, um, includes is kind of more robust and has become somewhat more popular as it involves uh, tumor stage, functional status of the liver, uh, performance status, um, and also symptoms. And there are, you know, different um, uh, populations of patients have had uh, different uh, recommendations made um, and validated within those pop uh, populations, and they're listed down here, and I'm, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, the main thing is that, you know, no system's perfect, and uh, there's a lot of factors that go into treatment planning. Um, I won't read this off, but the child Pew score, uh, you can see here, um, it's just uh, calculated, and it's usually the, the A and the B that might be more appropriate for treatment with uh, chemoembolization, but, um, and this is the uh, Barcelona uh, liver cancer staging, which um, it gives uh, tr treatment recommendations, um, and this is uh, in kind of more advanced uh, disease. This is where serafinib, the uh, medication I was telling you about, would, would fit in. And then, um, you know, ideally down here in your, your curative treatments, you have uh, resection or uh, transplantation, and then, um, certain patients can receive um, ablation. I'm just trying to go through this somewhat fast so we can get to the article. Um, and then uh, for transplant, the uh, uh, Milan criteria, which uh, was a uh, 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 criteria based on a study in Italy that had shown that uh, patients that met these criteria um, seem to do reasonably well after um, transplant. Um, there's another criteria uh, that's a slightly, I guess, more lenient, which would be the UCSF uh, criteria, which is um, something else you could read up on. And the, the MELT score, which was used in the paper we'll be discussing tonight, uh, which you calculate here is. Um, I'm not going to read all the, the indications for chemoembolization, just the, you know, some things to keep in mind that uh, portal vein fibrosis can be a, a relative contraindication that depending on the extent. Um, you have to also take in, like I said, the, the whole patient. So and the fact that you're giving chemotherapy. So there'll be chemotherapy limited um, indications and contraindications, um, as well as metabolic performance status and then different factors of the, the tumor. 
Um, just uh, this is out of the second edition of Abrams. It's uh, post demobilization syndrome. The main thing I want to point out here is that this is going to be one of your most common uh, complications afterward. And, uh, abdominal pain, nausea, um, fever. Um, so now I'll get to the actual uh, article. Um, so the authors are um, from the um, hospital uh, Israel, Ida, Albert Einstein in Brazil. This was in the uh, 2014, the July 2014 interventional oncology dedicated issue of JVIR. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more about what the, the key findings were. Um, so the materials and methods, uh, it was a single center study. Um, for this, it was prospective uh, with a single arm. Uh, there were 154 patients. Um, and according to the authors, it was uh, the largest uh, study that they had known of uh, to date. Um, so 154 patients, and there was a total, so some patients received multiple, a total of 266. Um, uh, it was all drug-eluting B chemoembolizations uh, were performed uh, fairly recently, over two years. Um, part of the liver transplant program, um, so all the patients had to be part of the liver transplant program for bridging or downstaging. Um, in the pretreatment evaluation, they had uh, obviously imaging, uh, medical and physical evaluation, and then they also calculated the child view and um, melt scores. Uh, Eligibility was as above that they were in the transplant uh, program, and um, patients who cannot receive a transplant due to liver functional status or malignancy related issues were excluded. And this is just a little bit more about the, the patients here. So you'll see that a majority were the child to um, A or B, and um, that was the main thing I wanted to focus on there. So pre-procedure, all patients received hydration, antibiotics, the standard pre-procedure. Um, uh, medications. And then the, I guess the key things to, to focus on during the procedure is that they had standard conscious sedation. Um, the um, uh, 100 to 300 uh, micrometer drug eluting beads um, with uh, 50 uh, milligrams of uh, doxorubicin. Uh, the endpoint, and this can be important in comparing different papers and uh, on this topic, was near stasis. Um, observing the artery directly feeding the tumor. Um, if stasis was not achieved, they did additional with uh, slightly larger beads. And that they used the closure system in every patient. Um, Post-procedure care, uh, the patients were observed for six hours. Um, they were on bed rest. Um, they were hydrated. Um, the pain control, um, if you haven't heard of this, they just said in, in many countries it's, it's banned because of a risk of, uh, it's a non-opioid uh, analgesic that's banned for the risk of agranulocytosis. Um, and then, so this is on a scale from 1 to 10 for the report of pain by the patient. This is what they received. Um, the criteria for discharge by a registered nurse was that if they, um, at six hours, uh, can ambulate 10 minutes, had stable vitals, had pain scores from one, uh, less, less than or equal to three, and otherwise uneventful stay. And then they were given these medications um, for pain. The uh, primary endpoint uh, that they were looking for, so was the patient admitted on the same day? Did they come back within a month? And they also uh, recorded any uh, morbidity and mortality associated with the procedure. Um, and then these were all the outcome variables, which we'll kind of discuss what they actually were. Um, I'll read here. The main thing here is that, you know, they were looking, was it um, HCC, uh, was the treatment for downstaging or bridging? So they were actually able to, almost 90% of their patients uh, discharge on the same day. 10.5 um, needed admission. Um, they had a very high rate of uh, technical success. They had one uh, iatrogenic dissection of the common hepatic artery. The main reason for admission was abdominal pain, um, and the, these are some of the other uh, reasons. They did have one puncture site bleeding with one patient. Uh, one patient had an MI. Um, this is sometimes uh, referred to as a worsening of uh, comorbidity. Um, they had no deaths during the first 30 days, and uh, post stabilization syndrome requiring admission was observed in 9.3% of the procedures. Uh, so the mean procedure duration was 61.7 minutes, mean dose was 36.7 uh, milligrams, and the uh, medium of, uh, median of uh, uh, 1.3 embolic agents, uh, uh, embolic agent vials uh, per patient were used. 
so um, sorry if I just could go back to here. So the the big thing was this uh, significant. There was a statistical significance in the patients um, who were receiving um, chemolization for downstaging um, that were admitted. So you were more likely to be admitted if you're rece receiving uh, chemolization for downstaging rather than bridging. So you might. Uh, kind of infer from that that they were probably had to be a little bit more aggressive or embolize a little bit more if they were trying to, to bring the, the stage down. Um, there was also, you were less likely to be admitted if you had some oxycodone uh, before the procedure. Um, the other thing was the number of embolic, um, the, the other statistically significant um, uh, difference was in the number of embolic agent vials, which might have been related to what the if it was bridging or uh, downstaging. So if you had, um, they had an odds ratio down here that if you had um, uh, a second vial used, you were about 1.5 uh, times more likely to be admitted. And uh, the there was a relationship that, that wasn't statistically significant for the, the actual dose. And um, so that's, that's, that's the paper. Um, you know, I, I have here some uh, similar studies. One's out of UMB and J, the other one out of uh, the second out of Emory. Um, you know, I, I guess for the discussion, um, I think some of the key points uh, from what I've seen from reading all these different papers is going to be a lot about uh, which patients you've selected. Um, sometimes the, uh, the the type of procedure uh, that you do, whether it be, although you know this. this Paper from UMD and J used both uh, conventional uh, and bland embolization and um, had a high um, uh, uh, same day discharge rate. But um, I, I think the key things to read again when you're um, looking at these different papers is what is their their outcome? Is it or what is their goal? Is it near stasis during the procedure? Or sometimes is it that dose? And just the the actual patient type I think may, could make a big difference. And um, that's, that's, that's it for me. Great. Hey, thank you so much, Chris, and great job. So this article I thought was really interesting. It's IR and even more specifically IO sometimes are touting that we can do things that are safer and shorter and with a shorter recovery with better outcomes and then also do it in a more cost-effective manner. And, you know, if you can do things on an outpatient basis, it's is more convenient for the patient, it definitely decreases cost, and it's just a, a matter of deciding which patients maybe should or shouldn't be managed on an outpatient basis, because sometimes these patients are really sick. And so my main question, I think, and then we'll just turn time over to our faculty, is did you feel that these DC criteria that they were using would catch the patients that could have significant complications, or do you feel like there are certain patients that may qualify for this more than others that maybe it's not just um, their post-embolization type syndrome, but maybe other risk factors for other things that should be considered? You know, this is this is Bob, DJ. Thanks for the question, and Chris, nice review. Um, you know, it's interesting. You know, there, there are a lot of therapies that, intra-arterial therapies we have for hepatocellular carcinoma from just bland embolization to conventional chemoembolization, drug eluting bead chemoembolization, radio embolization, um, and and really there are no studies to date that suggest that one is more effective than the other. In general, just a, a very good prospective randomized trial, and I don't know if we'll ever have that information. There are differences in in how we do these procedures and how we manage these patients, and in general, we take bland and any of the chemoembolizations, and there's those are typically inpatient procedures, you get admitted, and that's because the risk of post-embolization syndrome and symptoms is quite high. Now some of that is, is, is historic because the, the techniques that we use in the patient selection, et cetera, has gotten a lot better, and, and we used to do chemoembolization with five French catheters and do low bar therapy or maybe even whole liver therapy where now we use microcatheters and are doing selective therapies. So it's changed a, a big deal. Um, and, and when we start looking at a paper like this, and, and drug eluting beads, uh, what it did show in, in sicker patients that it's better tolerated, so you maybe consider start doing outpatient therapy with it. The other thing is, is that this patient was looking specifically at patients that were mostly within Milan criteria, so these were more B 
BCLCA type patients or, or very healthy BCLCB patients. So these were, when you look at that, that algorithm, these are not the typical patients that we think of with chemoembolization. These are, we talk about bridging, these are people with small tumors, either one tumor under five centimeters or uh, up to three tumors under three centimeters. So by definition, these are better patients um, and uh, you're, you're, they don't really go into it in this paper, but I'm, I'm guessing these are selective treatments. For all of you trainees and, and the fellows have probably no more than the residents at this point and the medical students, but usually when you see these patients that have gotten chemobilization the next day, they look great. They feel great, and you're wondering why they're in the hospital. They're wondering that too. If they don't get out of the hospital by around noon or so, um, by the time the afternoon comes around, all of a sudden they start having pain and all these issues. And if they're not out of the hospital, then all of a sudden uh, the, the other physicians taking care of them start ordering EGDs and, and right upper quadrant ultrasounds and labs. So, you know, keeping them there the first 23 hours afterwards or so or is, is really not that helpful often unless you're doing these more uh, you know, patients with bigger disease burden, low bar therapies, um, and you're having these more significant symptoms. So um, it's interesting um, uh, to think about. I think there is a role for doing a lot of these therapies, particularly these selective therapies in healthy patients as outpatient. You know, you look at radioembolization, one of the drawbacks for that is that there's a planning day. So while chemoembolization, you get admitted to the hospital and you have more side effects, radioembolization is better tolerated in general, but you have to have a, a, an extra procedure for the planning day. A paper we published recently in JVIR uh, it was actually we're doing now same day radioembolization, so we're doing the mapping and the treatment in the same day to try to mitigate that potential negative for radioembolization. So um, you can see uh, people doing the different procedures are trying to find ways to make these procedures more beneficial to patients because we really don't know which procedures ultimately are going to be the best for each patient. Yeah, I I look at um, people trying to do this. I think for anybody, you know. For all the guys in training, when you go out, you know, if you're going to try to do this, pick your first patients very, very carefully. Um, yeah, there have been some abstracts on this as well at SIR from other institutions than the two in these other papers. And going back to finances, some of this was based on hospitals telling the IR guys that we need to keep beds open for other patients, and so you guys need to find a way to do this as outpatient. Um, so there are, the group was essentially forced into doing a project on it and trying to figure out who they could do this on and who they couldn't. You know, that's obviously not the ideal way to do something like this. Um, you know, there are people I treat that I'm like, there's no reason to keep them there, but you know, anybody that has a higher bilirubin that I'm worried about them getting dehydrated and tanking their liver, I would be pretty hesitant still with, with chemo to send them home. Um, I agree with Bob 100% that DEBs are easier to tolerate, at least in the very short term, than traditional chemobilization, especially if you can do super selective treatments. Um, the one thing I like to see what Bob thinks on this is that I've been debating sending our portal vein embolizations home the same day, which is, you know, flipping the topic a little bit. But those guys, I mean, we put like 15 vials of particles in their liver and they don't even look like we touched them sometimes. And it seems to me like those guys, um, other than some mild hydration, they really don't need to be in the hospital at all after treatment. Yeah, Dan, we, we uh, well, first of all, we don't do a lot of portal vein embolization. I, I say we maybe do three to five a year. Um, maybe it's referral pattern, et cetera. Um, but we don't plan on admitting those patients. If for some reason they're having a lot of post-procedure pain, which is unusual, uh, we will admit them. But uh, I, I agree, we don't uh, routinely admit them um, after our procedures. We don't also, I don't know how you do it, but uh, ablations. We don't routinely admit our ablations after procedures either. They, everything... The only, the only procedures we really admit are, are either bland or chemobilization. Those are routinely admitted, um, but the rest of the procedures are not. Yeah, I, I admit renal cryos just because they have a small but definite risk of blowing out and bleeding uh, four to five hours after the case. And it's just one of those things where I feel I sleep better. Uh, maybe I'm treating myself more than the patient. But it's not a, a common thing. But if they they can bleed enough that they can get into trouble. Um, but I agree. I mean, I don't plan on, on admitting liver ablations or bone ablations, uh, lung ablations, which you know we don't do a ton of here. Uh, if their lungs are expanded after several hours, I'm not worried about them getting a new mall. Send those guys home too. Um, so you know, I think the more stuff you can do outpatient, and that's a driver of a topic like this too. If you're uh, you know, if you're a, a company making 
drug eluting beets, you know, not naming companies by name, of course, you know, I mean, you definitely have an interest in trying to accomplish this and get patients out the same day. Um, you know, this is, you know, there's a very competitive environment for this marketplace. Well, thank you, all of you, for your wonderful comments and our, our two presenters, too, for summarizing those articles. And again, they've done this on their own time while they are, uh, of course, being busy. And we are very grateful for our panelists. A lot of you are on the East Coast, and so it's late. And really appreciate you being here. And these articles, too, uh, these are great articles that help us think of new things. And again, trying to improve interventional radiology, interventional oncology, and just trying to see what we can do to help patients more. And this is a great resource for doing that. Um, we do have a few polling questions in the next few minutes that we could maybe ask. Dave, if you could pull up um, just sure. a few of those and we'll sure. fire through them really quick just out of interest. Sure. We'll, uh, we'll go through these. Um, there are, people are submitting a couple of questions, too, so let me know if you uh, okay. wanted me to ask those. I'm going to launch some. Like DJ was saying, we have some poll questions. I'm going to go ahead and launch them, I guess. Okay. Um, if you have a bunch of... Uh, questions. I'm not seeing those come through. Maybe we can answer those first if there aren't too many. Um, the polling thing is something that's new, so we may try that too before everybody's gone. But, sure. Um, let's answer some of the audience okay. questions if you have some. Well, only, only two that are in right now. The first question was, one of our panelists is actually seeing a patient with a T1 lesion um, in the right upper lobe. The question is, how, how do you evaluate a screen and work up uh, t these T1 patients, I guess? Dr. Brown or Dr. Lewandowski, would you? I probably saw Bob starting to talk there. No, no, go ahead, Dan. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, the whole goal of doing minimally invasive therapy is that, you know, in surgery, if they're going to do that, they'll do mediastinoscopy, and they'll be really aggressive up front to make sure the surgery is warranted. I mean, as someone who you've excluded surgery, I mean, you want to have a good quality CT scan. If there's any question about anything else, a PET scan may be appropriate if you can get one done. Um, so uh, I would start there. And, you know, again, your cure rate here is going to be small. There's definitely a group you're going to cure. Uh, and by the time they come to you, they've often had chemo and they've been imaged out the wazoo anyway. Um, so you're going to probably have anything else you need, like if, if you're uh, referring docs and you're seeing these patients, they'll probably scan the brain every so often. Although if they're not having focal symptoms, I'm not sure that's indicated. Great. Thank you. Uh, what was the other question? You the other question uh, coming from uh, Doug Murray. Uh, they discussed the influence of the NCCN guidelines and the need for good prospective randomized trials. What, what do you think is the most important factor prohibiting IR from being included in more of these guidelines or participating in prospective randomized trials? And how do we increase IR's voice and participation at this level? Well, boy, that, that's a good question. I mean, that's, it's, a, it's somewhat of a political question. Um, and, and we are seeing IR procedures and, and therapies being included in NCCN guidelines. Um, it's a matter of, of, number one, producing higher levels of evidence, which is, is something we always talk about, and it's not just lip service. There's a lot of, there are a lot of uh, good publications coming out now. Uh, there are a lot of good studies, some actually uh, uh, you know, level one, phase three type trials being done, um, and a lot of industry sponsored, uh, which we need. Um, you know, our, our industry does not have the same type of capital as, say, the pharmaceutical company, but um, number one, we have to provide the data. Number two, we have to have people that, are, that can, can uh, really participate in these panels um, and, and understand and, and, and know the disease processes, the other therapies that are being used, the levels of evidence for these other therapies, um, and, and we're seeing that. So now we're seeing interventional radiologists participating in these panels. Um, at our institution, um, our, one of our medical oncologists runs a couple of the panels, and, and he's always asking uh, my partner and I, Riyadh, uh, um, Salem, you know, what do we think? He sends us the things, and we get an opportunity to sort of tell him what we think or, or, or argue for our therapies in these different panels, and um, whether we're always successful or not, as is, is, is it will be seen, but um, at least we're, we're at the, the conversation now. So I think it's something that will continue to evolve. Yeah, I'm actually on the NCCN um, uh, paddleability group and uh, that Al Benson runs. He's got Bob was just mentioning, uh, at least I think it is. 
Yeah. And um, yeah, we just did the we just updated and we're negotiating through the colorectal guidelines right now. And a good example of how we can do better is, you know, there's a large collaborative study coming out uh, hopefully this fall on Y90 plus other uh, plus chemo for first line colorectal liver meds versus chemo alone. And I think that study, I mean, I think it would probably apply to either Y90 group just to avoid any perception of bias. But that's what we need because they're going to have 420 patients in that study. And that's, that, if it works, that's level one evidence. And that's a huge deal. And that, that's the kind of stuff we need, um, you know, because right now, um, if you look at the studies that go to first-line, second-line therapies, they all have 800 patients in them. So I don't know, you know, randomized perspective is going to be hard to do, but getting large groups of like-minded patients that you can get value out of is a, um, is a key component to getting this done. You know, and again, I'm not trying to rip anything, but you know, if you have 40 patients in a study, we talk about this a lot. Things like WCIO, you'll hear Mike Solon talk about this all the time. You know, a 40 patient study may prove a small point, but it's not going to get you anywhere with those guidelines. Yeah, and that's, you know, you talk about the colon uh, guidelines, you know, you look at something like radio embolization, which um, now there are, you know, five, six, seven hundred patients um, across publications internationally that all have the same signal that in the salvage setting um, in, in liver dominant disease, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it seems to be a very rewarding therapy. However, because they were all published independently, um, we look at other therapies like infusion pump or even third line like regorafrenib or something like that. Um, which have really limited data, um, make the guidelines. Um, so we really have to be smart about how we compile our evidence. And, and um, you know, there may be a role for more of these registry type things where people and in institutions are compiling their data. I think it's something the Society of Interventional Radiology is interested in, in doing. Um, you know, we also, all of a sudden we publish a multi-institution, uh, maybe multi, uh, um, uh, multinational uh, publication with 500 patients. Um, that, that's much better than 10 publications with 100 patients. Yeah, I think that's something that's uh, very exciting, and it's exciting to see it growing. I feel like a lot of this is, it's been going on for years, and I'm just new to it as well, but it's exciting to see just the volume expanding and seeing how many people are getting involved, and as SIR is starting to coordinate these efforts, that's, uh, it'll be interesting to see what the future holds, and I think that's one of the most exciting parts about this specialty is just seeing it grow and knowing what the future is going to bring. Um, thank you again, everyone, for your comments and uh, for participating tonight. We'll try a couple of these polling questions. I know everybody is in different levels of training, and so you may not have the best or any <laughs> answers to these questions, but. If you don't know, you can say you don't know, and we're just trying to get a feel for our audience and then get a feel for um, the types of things we'll be needing to do in the future as we try to do these journal clubs and then maybe a tumor board uh, of sorts in the future as well. So Dave, I'll turn the time over to you for a little bit, and we can go through some of these questions if that's OK. Sure. Um, now, can, um, so the first poll question is up. Um, on average, how frequently does your IR section perform RFA on T1 lung cancer? Uh, p panelists and uh, Dr. Brown and Lewis, can you see the poll? I'm, cause we're still, this is kind of a newer function that we're still working through. You, you should not be able to, okay, you should not be able to participate. Okay, we have about 56% of the people that voted. So let's give it a couple more seconds and then I'll close it and I'll look at the responses. Um, can we see the results after everybody's yep. answered? Yep. Yep. At the end? Okay. People, people yeah. are still answering. We got about 68% of people voted. So if you guys okay. can get those let's get those last votes in. Um, we have uh, seven total questions, and like DJ was saying, it's getting kind of late. So, yeah. all right, I'm going to close this poll in three, two, one. Okay. And should be able to, so you guys look at the results. Yeah, so it looks like uh, a lot of uh, split. Most people don't know, <laughs> and I think that's reflective of our training levels and our interaction with IR a little bit during our diagnostic residency still. Um, but then a fair amount, say less than a month, 
25 percent of respondents. So, okay, the one a month is still pretty rare, which is expected. If you want to jump to um, Oops. maybe number four, asking oh. about outpatient taste. Sorry about that. I uh, I, I jumped oh, the gun. Okay. We, we can only okay. open them once too. Sorry, but and th Take this a is sick of time. Yeah. So and this is for for the attendees that filled this one out. This is a multiple answer, so you can check as many of the uh, choices as you want. Given SBRT is the norm, what do you think may be the best way to increase lung cancer patient referrals to IR? We got about 20, uh, 32 percent have answered. Can I just throw a thought out there? What people are answering? Yeah, people yeah. are answered. We got about 58, 48 percent right now. What I was just going to say is, you know, my thought is try to find a way to prove that you have value in doing it. Like, can you get more biopsies for the for the referring docs so they can hmm. they can use that for targeted therapies? Hmm. You know, that that's kind of to me is, you know, you can biopsy and ablate in the same session, and if you get a couple big cores and you get a pneumo, well, you're going to fry it anyway. You know, you don't have to worry about uh, seeding it, and then they get information they can use, and you can also try to debulk these things uh, in non-surgical candidates. And I think that may be a way to to stimulate this with all the interest in uh, repeat biopsies in these patients. Hmm. That's a great idea. One-stop shop. <laughs> Hopefully it works here sometime, but uh, <laughs> we're still working on that here. But uh, that's, you know, the, with all the targeted therapies and all that stuff, the biop you, you cannot underestimate the value of biopsying stuff yeah. and uh, providing that information for the referring docs, especially uh, medical oncology. I mean, that is a, you know, you, you need to find ways to collaborate and prove value. And with medical oncology, you can never have enough tissue. Right. All right, so we got about 67%. Give you guys a couple more seconds. Three, two, one. And again, this was a multiple answer. So I'll go ahead and show those. Okay. So this is something that we've been doing, not just for interventional oncology, but in our service lines. We've organized subcommittees uh, to try to create resources to educate referring providers, especially in training. And so it's kind of great to see that 77% number supporting that that's a good area. And then the subspecialists. The primary care doctors, too, I think is something that would be interesting. And maybe Dr. Brown and Lewandowski can comment on these things as well. But I really feel like if we can spread the word, a lot of the things that we can do IR still aren't known to a lot of specialist and it's really just about knowing how to whether it's formal advertising or just spreading the word education wise it's good to know how to get involved okay. um, one thing I'll, I'll say about um, referring like primary care doctors most of the lung cancer patients are going to be coming from specialists so that's the way it is but I don't think you can underestimate that for something like PAD uh, Brigham um, yep. has a number of outpatient IR centers where they do PAD interventions, and they started those by putting in suites and clinics next to primary care offices as a strategic plan, and just let those guys know if people came in with cold feet and stuff like that or claudication, sent them over for evaluation, they would dive on them and do the cases. They very aggressively pursued it, and that's how they built their practice. So for different things, primary care doctors will be a big advantage, although it may not necessarily be in cancer. Yeah. Yeah, I agree uh, you know, with you, Dan. It's, you know, there, there are a lot of things that we as interventional radiologists can do that would be great to have the primary care doctor as referral, but um, you're right. Uh, you know, by the time somebody's considering what to do for that, that lung cancer, um, they've seen a medical oncologist, they've seen a surgical oncologist, so it's not going to be coming from the primary care. Yeah. I think I'll wrap things up on my end, and then, Dave, if you wanted to make a few comments, it looks like that would be great. Sure. Um, again, everyone, thanks. I know it's late for a lot of you, and you've already put in a full day. So thank you so much to our presenters, Eric and Chris. They're doing lots of great things in addition to working hard, and they've done this just out of the goodness of their hearts. And then also for our amazing examples through Dr. Lewandowski and Dr. Brown, who really are leading us in this field, and, and there's always reaching out to us and doing a lot of things to help us and it's, it's really appreciated. 
Again, this webinar has been recorded and will be posted on YouTube under the SIR RFS tag later, so you can link it up if you need to. But again, please send your feedback if you have any ideas for these webinars or even if you would like to do more or get involved in the Interventional Oncology Service Line or any of the service lines, please feel free to contact us. And from my end, I'm done. So again, everybody have a great night. And Dave, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, no, not much to add. Um, really thanks to you know the DJ and the IO Service Line members for setting this up. I thought this was a great event. And especially uh, Dr. Brown and Dr. Lewandowski taking time out of your extremely busy schedules. Um, we're only as successful as, as we keep getting good faculty. Um, for, the, for the attendees, if you're interested in joining, on the home page, again, rfs.servweb.org, just click on this link. Um, it'll be able to uh, basically get you to the application page. So that's a good place to start. You can get in touch with any of us. And, uh, yeah, I think we'll call it a night. So thanks for everybody uh, logging in. Hope to see you next week again for uh, we have a pain service line webinar. So take care.